Um, I do hope you're going to bear with me given that I'm between you and lunch. Um, well, I'm going to talk about skill learning for autonomous robots. And as I did my PhD just about a few miles from Hollywood, let's take a couple of outtakes from a not so recent Hollywood movie anymore. This is from the movie iRobot. And you basically see the robots which we would like to have in future hospitals. Robots which can handle many different tasks, which can adapt to humans, and which can actually accomplish pretty complex feats together as shown in this picture, uh, I'll take up the movie, where they try to empty these trash cans. Now you see that these tasks have uncertainty in, their, uh, in both the task and the environment. They have they require the robots to adapt to humans, and the programming complexity of these scenarios is just tremendous. It's way beyond anything we can easily hack together as we usually do. So the obvious question is, how can we fulfill this Hollywood vision of future robots? And in robotics, we have so far had only one answer, and that was smart students. So we took students who were other programmers, like engineers, put them in a cellar, gave them pizza, Coca-Cola, and at the end of the semester, they would usually come up with a pretty good solution. With only one tiny drawback. At the next semester, you would have to start all over again with new students, new pizza, new Coca-Cola. So this is really not something we well which we really want to have forever, so much rather we would like our robots to obtain their skills automatically. And Again, that is already suggested in the introduction. We, that again already was something, of course, people thought on in the moment where machine learning came around. And obviously machine learning promised also way too much back then. They <coughs> thought they could literally learn anything. You just have to ask for a lot of data, you would throw the data into the machine, and the machine would come back with a solution. Well, that turned out to be a failure too. But for a very simple reason, and that is that Obviously, the more complex you make a system, the more data, exponentially more data you need, and henceforth, it's very, very hard to learn. So, what is it that we actually need? Well, I think what we need is a skill learning approach that takes the reality of robotics into account in order to learn something more complex. And that's exactly what we are trying to pursue for about well, more than 10 years by now. And I'm going to show mainly research to you um, and only at the very end give you an outlook of why this will become very important for the industry. So, in order to pursue this goal of skill learning, we actually have to think about three different questions. And the first one is, well, how can we actually accomplish motor learning? And the second one is, well, how can we do this then in at the, well, similarly good as humans do it with basic skills? And finally, how can we compose complex skills using the elements we've just learned for basic skills? So let's abstract the robot. From a machine learning point of view, we just have this black box or blue box, which is the autonomous learning robot, which is in the current state and which will produce an action. And it has an addition from the teacher a learning signal. And well, what would what does this learning then come then, well, what, what would the actions be? Well, the actions would, for example, be the torques it sends down to the motors um, in the arm. And the state would obviously be the position of the ball, the position of the arm, the velocity of the ball, the velocity of the arm. And, um, well, learning would in our case literally mean how, much, how, how well you would respect to this course or teacher. So what kind of scores do you get from the teacher? Well, the teacher obviously ideally just tells you good robot, bad robot, or robot copy my, my presented skill. But in practice, of course, you need to usually give it a quite an informative score. So for example, in this T-ball scenario, we gave it a score on how far it would shoot the ball while, giving it a, while reducing that score whenever it became too fast at the joint level, since otherwise it learns to hit faster and faster and in the end damages its body, um, given that it doesn't have a notion of pain, which we have so nicely built into our brain. So how can we accomplish something like this in, in robotics? Well, 
we mainly resorted to two types of learning. In one case, we have a teacher who shows an example behavior, and the robot should reproduce it, and the score is simply the proximity to the solution shown by the teacher. In contrast to this, we have learning from experience, which is also frequently modeled within the framework of reinforcement learning, where the teacher actually just tells the robot, good robot, bad robot, or um, 15 or 4 as a score of how well the robot is doing. And the robot will then subsequently will try and get a look where that can improve its score. So how would we do this in practice? Well, it's actually surprisingly easy, easy to understand. Um, when what we are basically assuming is a structure which we can train in order to reproduce examples. So if you have here, for example, a plot where each of these um, stars is a data point, and one axis are the actions, one axis are the states where this action was taken in, well, in this case, if you were just trying to learn from the teacher, you really want to reproduce this distribution of the states and actions. And you don't want to exclude too many pairs, since you may actually lose very essential information. Um, so you don't just want to learn well, for every state a particular action, but really the distribution of the complete state action set, as you've observed it from the teacher. This then, then allows you to generalize. And in contrast to this, learning from experience is somewhat harder. Since when you learn from experience, you obviously have to try something. And this, this tr first of all, you need to figure out what you actually want to try, how you can try something, and then how you will actually improve. And this has been a big topic for a very long time, machine learning. Machine learning usually focuses then on very tiny examples, like you take a grid world, which models a maze, where some point robot tries to make it from state A to B. And then they will say, oh, yeah, and we directly need to go for getting the optimal score right away. Well, very few of us ever venture for complete optimality in our life. And this has a good reason, because if you directly try to venture for this, you will take a very, very long time to reach it. Most likely, you have so many bad experiences in your life that um, you will never even, well, you will never but you can get there, and you would probably break your mind. So you need something which is a more intelligent search strategy. And it turned out that there is a way to model this scenario within the same framework, just a slight bit different. So instead of just saying that you want to create policies which are optimal you know, right away with the reward, you want to create policies which improve the reward by matching what was good. So by matching a reward with a previous policy. Again, this can be made intuitive very nicely. Now let's say, think we just have the teacher who tells us good robot, and then it shows the plus, and bad robot, which shows here a minus. Then in this case, we obviously don't want to reproduce all the examples, but we would try to reproduce a distribution which fits the good robot examples more than the bad robot examples. But if there is a state where we only have a bad robot example, we are not going to give up, but we're going to stay around there and we're going to keep exploring around that scenario so that we don't try something crazy. And this is really quite crucial in order to get to a good behavior. Now, the very first thing where we tried this very, very long time back was with this little dog, which has by now become big dog, and you've probably seen this all on YouTube. But um, back then, we were teaching it where to place its feet by simply using this uh, reward weighted mapping. So now I now let's focus on the second question. How, is this all just not theory? No. We actually we need to now bring in a little bit more of robotics knowledge and then we can bring this to real robotics. This more robotics knowledge includes that we want to have a library of basic behaviors, we want to have some context which allows us to select such behaviors, and we want to have some support for execution. So the black box from before has become somewhat more of a white box. So let's look at learning of elementary behavior. Well, we can do this by imitation learning, as I've said before. And here we show the robot an example where it has a ball on a string. So it will be a rather fast movement of the ball. And the robot is now simply told, use your, this white, learn this white box 
learn one primitive in there in order to um, do this ball bouncing thing. And, well, quite surprisingly, this worked out of the box. This was actually really just one mounting of this experiment. So, reinforcement, um, obviously, you can't learn everything from a teacher, otherwise, you would all graduate with a PhD from kindergarten. Instead, we need this many, 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 many trials and hours of self improvement where we gather our own experience. And then we do this reward weighted matching where we start again with an imitation, but this time we fail, and our robot, well, our robot will subsequently try. And it gets a score on how much closer it gets the ball to the cap. And as you will see, initially it fails, then it self improves, and gets closer and closer to the, well, to the, the cup. And after about 40 something trials, it usually gets it into the cup for the very first time. After um, about 90 trials, it gets into the cup basically all of the time. And we've had whole afternoons of um, demos where it didn't get it from where it was perfect every single time. But as it's compared to humans, well, kids at the age of um, six to eight don't manage to learn it at all. Eight to uh, the ten to twelve age, they manage to learn it uh, within 30 trials, but they never become perfect. So they are fast initially, but they never reach the same quality. And grown-ups manage to learn within three or four trials. So it seems to be only me who took. <laughs> so, now let's take one behavior which we've learned and reuse this one behavior in new scenarios. It's way more UK than Germany, making dark games. Um, and what you see here is this yellow dot indicating this is an around the clock dart game. And it has learned only one primitive for throwing darts to exactly one location, but subsequently, we reuse this now in the in this dart game, and we, um, we also did some blackjack-like dart games later. And um, you can reuse one behavior in ma many different scenarios. There. Now I hope I can show this on this humanoid robot. So for that, our own robots didn't suffice as we don't have a lightweight hand, and which you need for a dart release. And so what you see here is how the robot has learned to throw the darts already, and here it is a part of a dart game. Oops, I'm running low on time, I hope, so I've got to be faster. Um, throwing and catching can be modeled in the same way where now two robots independently learn two tasks and then we share a reward. As you see here. Okay, so how can we compose complex skills with these primitives? Well, obviously, we need to put all of this together. And for that, we chose table tennis as an example, where we gave the robot, well, now just not just one demonstration, but multiple. And you see here the basic training. From this, we can take now by imitation learning, meaning a lot of primitives, learn these all into a library. And from this library, based on the incoming ball, select now different kind of strokes and um, by well, mixing them based on, on the weighting factor we can now create even completely novel strokes which you hadn't seen before quite easily and generalize over a wide range of the table. Um, we actually get against the ball gun already just by mutation running to about 69% of the balls returned successfully. Um, and, um, well, obviously that's just 69%, so we need the self-improvement. And we decided to aim the ball down at locations where it had failed. And when you do then self-improvement on these locations, just like a good tennis teacher would teach you, um, the robot quite quickly manages to adapt and get, the, the, get a better policy. Finally, here you see the robot playing against the maker. So this is Katarina Milling, my PhD student who worked on this project. <laughs> and um, I would say they're equally good table tennis player, but she's definitely the better computer scientist. <laughs> so
So, well, you should notice one thing. And this one thing is that our robot in this scenario only chose, mainly chose, they decided to chose four hands. And that is because it's very hard for it to switch. So for this reason, we focus next on this problem where we predict what the opponent would be doing already before he has hit the ball. So all of these are ball positions before the arm has even touched the ball. And we would predict very much with the ball. And you can do this to an accuracy of about 30 centimeters, which is then enough to actually do a quick, about to even have the robot prepare long before um, the human has even started. So now I'm quickly wrapping up with a conclusion. And please give me one more minute for that. And um, obviously, it's not all table tennis. We are actually aiming at industrial applications for this. Since um, in Europe, we have a problem. We cannot produce many things simply because they're either produced in too low quantity or at a too low a price. This, and the bottleneck there is not just manual labor. It's not actually the manual labor, but the manual labor of programming the robots. So whenever, for example, BMW builds a new line, they rather buy new robots and reprogram everything from scratch than to reprogram their robots. And similarly, this Bosch study even gives very concrete figures for this. And while well, I don't need to build on the previous talks, but obviously in assisted robotics and robots at home, um, such technologies would be very valuable since you don't want to teach your nurse how to program a robot. We personally, we use this mainly now with three companies where we collaborate, which includes ABB, Honda Research, and um, Bosch, which are all trying to now bring their techniques to our um, workplaces. With that, I'm at the conclusion and hope that I've kind of made the case motor skill learning is a fascinating topic. It's going to be very, very helpful. and is now at the level where slowly but surely companies should really think about using it in practical application. For that, I would like to thank you for your attention and for all this year's my team who obviously deserve the credit for much of their work.